Good afternoon. I'm Kimberly Torkelson, and on behalf of 451 Research and Securionics, I'd like to welcome everyone and say thank you for attending today's webcast. Leading off the presentation today from 451 Research is Eric Ogren, Senior Analyst for Information Security. Following Eric will be David Swift, Principal Architect at Securonics. By way of housekeeping, today's event will run between 45 and 60 minutes, including time at the end for you to ask questions. We will then conclude with a quick Q&A to address questions from the audience. You can submit questions via the text box below. The slides will also be available for download at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Happy holidays to all. Um, and, and thank you for joining us on this session. I'm actually really excited uh, about this. I, I cover applied behavior analytics for 451, and coming up in 2017, I will be more of the security operations uh, focus. So I'm actually very excited about this because, and I like the title that David Swift, my uh, colleague at Securonix, has, has come up with for solving critical security problems with behavior analytics, because what makes behavior analytics special is that it does solve the most critical problems that we have. Um, I'm going to go on about for about 10, 12 minutes. But before I do that, um, David, thank you so much. Let me give David a little bit of air time to introduce himself. And um, David, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eric. So hi, guys. My name is David Swift. I've been in security about 15 years and technology about 30. I'm the geek that they bring to the meetings. My goal here is to be a resource to you guys, help add some color, some stories, some background to what's actually happening. Uh, when I say a geek, I'm a geek, I've got the credentials to prove it. I've got about 30 certs, including CISSP and GSEC and intrusion analyst and incident handler, and I do breach responses and all kinds of fun stuff, building security programs for little companies like Apple and Microsoft and Chevron and Visa. Eric? <laughs> That is so cool. Well, let me go through my bit. I'm an analyst, and, and uh, I know most of the, the people that have uh, you're spending the next hour with us want to hear for the geeks, not only because you know so much from hands-on, but geeks never lie. It's, uh, it's, it's actually it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but anyway, let me, go, let me go through a little bit of setting up so you can uh, learn a little bit more about uh, Securonics and Sniper and, and what they've got going on. Uh, this is a slide from our research. It's um, 843 people. But it's just sometimes I like to put this up front in my presentations just to kind of reaffirm what it is that you know we are all in security for. You know, it's you know, we're here to protect the business, you know, people and data. You know, we're not here to run through exploits and and take an academic uh, exercise about the dark web. Even though uh, I guess if we were experiencing it, that would be an issue. We're here to track. You know, suspicious software. We want to get malware out of our environment. We want to make sure our data doesn't doesn't leak out. And you know, where we say user behavior here at the top, it's we really want to make sure that our employees are safe in the cyber community, uh, if you will, and you know can go about and do their jobs as 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 best we can. So I'll come back to this, but you know, sometimes I wanted to introduce that concept, and sometimes we kind of lose sight because we spend so much time trying to make sure all of the parts are working that we forget what we're here for. Um, behavior analytics is actually gaining a lot of traction, significant traction, because it helps us in this mission of, of protecting the business in, in ways that um, our other security products don't. <clears throat> and we see this a little bit here. Uh, this is actually very recent data. Uh, the survey data I'm showing you is, is all from 2016, so it's, it's pretty topical. In this one, we asked organizations what their top three projects are. And um, you know, endpoint security, you know, SIM, and then security awareness are, are the top three. But really, for me, it's SecOps is number two. And the reason I translate that is because you know, a lot of the vendors I'm talking to, or enterprises I talk to, I should say, are actually looking to change their budget allocations a bit. Um, you know, they want to be able to um, take the costs out of log management. They want to be able to look at tools, and, and why it's number two is look at tools like behavior analytics to be able to support that mission of getting malware out of the system and protecting data, protecting employees, protecting people, um, you know, in, in my opinion. So very topical. SecOps is number two. It's, it's, a, it's a big issue, and, 
And you know, it, it deserves tools. This one is kind of what our life is like today. We have all these silos, you know, and they all generate alerts because they need to tell you that they're on the job and they're doing really, really good things for you and, 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 and earning their keep. But for us, it's like, okay, what do we do with all this stuff? These are noise generators. I mean, we have a real problem with, uh, I love the side of a, a noise hazard, is we have all these alerts that we have to make sense out of. <clears throat> Excuse me. And really what we want to do is protect our business, and we're spending more and more time on compliance and, and trying to figure out alerts, tracing them back to IP addresses and MAC addresses and users and, and history of what they did. It's a very, very time-consuming thing. And we're all busy. I mean, we don't really have a lot of time to go off on, uh, on, on wild goose chases. The other thing I'd like to point out is, <clears throat> you know, starting from the beginning, is how do you really know you have a security issue? I mean, I think it tends not to start with security products. I mean, you can open a security incident if, say, your IDS reports something and, you, and you're savvy enough to be able to pick out the, the, the big alert from, from all the things it's telling you. But generally, it's going to be, you know, a user reporting that their machine is wonky or performance of a, of a key application that is down or data is starting to appear out of the network and you're starting to observe something big. It tends to start with behavior. And it tends to start with behavior that's measured by, again, by people and data. So anyway, SecOps <clears throat> has to make sense of all these alerts. Uh, really hard job, but it, it becomes a job in and of itself of, of managing logs and, and doing reporting compliance. This is uh, something we did. This is actually, this, this is one survey we did from uh, a couple of years ago before I joined 4FD1 Group, but it does show that how we drive applied behavior analytics. We asked, I love the question, you know, what is, what is shelfware? You know, what products do you put on the shelf and, and, and make coasters out of? And same as number one, because it, it tends to be collecting logs, but it doesn't necessarily have all of the tools that you need to do your job, to be able to, to keep the business safe and secure. I mean, SecOps deserves better. Um, and we see that a little bit in that result. So what happened? And how do we get here? Because... Yeah, you know, Sims came out right around the year 2000. It's only about 15 years old. It should be pretty well debugged now. But the world goes moves fast. And we've seen IT and consumer technology has changed a lot. Um, you know, when Sim was invented, everything was kind of in the network. Now everyone's mobile. Everyone has laptops. They have mobile devices. They have phones. As IT people, you don't even see what your end users are doing necessarily. They're doing it on the road. They're doing it at home, and then they come back and plug in their, you know, their Mac or their their, their laptop onto the network, and shazam, all kinds of stuff happens. But you don't have a chance to actually be able to observe, you know, what's changing on that endpoint. Our customers are shifting workloads into the cloud, um, and I see that more and more to save money and to put the workloads and the applications closer to the users. And how do you really manage all of this cloud-based activity? Again, it's not on your network. You don't see it. The other big thing is attacks have changed, and, and it kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with technology. You know, attacks aren't the worms and viruses as much from the days of yore. It's, they, use, they abuse business logic. I mean, with bots and social media attacks, which, you know, phishing and, and ransomware to get into your networks, you know, attackers don't have to write code and figure out how to get it into your network, how to hide, replicate itself, and then filter data out of the network without you knowing. Uh, it can go through and, you know, from social media and websites, you know, you know the data is just given to, to them. It's, it's a whole lot easier, and, and they can cover their tracks and, and avoid, you know, the, the uh, legal enforcement. So it's it's a big deal that attacks have changed. They use business logic, and if you think about it, an attack in, that gets into your network, you know, if the user carries into the laptop, that attack is going to use the business logic. It's going to use all of the privileges that that account already has. <clears throat> you will never see it from, a content, from an inspection standpoint. You'll only be able to see it from, from checking the behavior and, and, and detecting things that are unusual. And all this time, compliance has stayed, stayed the same. Um, yeah, let me just do one last thing, and I'm going to leave Sim behind in, in a second for you. 
Uh, but I just want to be clear. You know, I'm not an anti-SIM person. I'm very much pro-behavior analytics, pro-SecOps, uh, and, I'm not, and I don't at all suggest that you ignore compliance mandates. It just needs to be put in its place and understood. Uh, this slide actually, <laughs> actually, I actually love because in the last couple of months when I talk to chief security officers at enterprises, you know, I ask them, you know, how much, how much of, it, of this is a big data problem? How, how much is valued in, in terms of all this data you're collecting? And what I get is they don't often go back to the logs, you know, through, you know, they don't, they're too busy. <laughs> so it's, yeah, they need it. And if the board ever asks what, you know, what happened three months ago, they, you know, they need to be an answer, needs to be an answer. Um, but it's not a security operations thing anymore. I mean, you look for the answers, you look for what's going on and for insight, but what you get is this big swamp of a warehouse where you know, the data you need could be anywhere and could be in any shape. So I'm, st I'm starting to see you know, real trends actually in terms of log management taking the cost off towards people adopting you know, elastic and Hadoop-based structures or at least posi positioning themselves uh, that way. So let's go back. You know, our main mission now, get, get the malware, you know, catch threats of the, and protect the business. You know, data, people, configurations, uh, let's make sure we're on top of all of that. And that's really what is driving applied behavior analytics. And it is, no question about it. It's the new frontier. It lives in the gaps. So it's very simple terms. We detect attacks that use approved business logic. And the easiest example that I can come up with is phishing, which you know, it's, a, it's a huge problem for all of us, but if you think of the siloed effects and tools that try to help you with phishing, well, you can sit in the network and you can look and see if there's, there's links in there. You can do something with firewalls and IP reputation services that go, it's going out, and now you've got downloads and, and you know, executable code coming back into your network. The endpoint configuration then may change, and then that endpoint in turn they start exhibiting behavior like going into databases and grabbing either data it hasn't accessed before or grabbing it in amounts that you, know, you haven't seen or time of day is, is a bit off. But if you think about it, you know, we've touched email, we've touched fi firewalls, we've touched, touched websites, we've touched endpoints, we've touched network security. It really is across the board, and, and ransomware is the same deal. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to use some behavior analytics to catch those abuses of, of just business logic. You know, employees can't give themselves privileges that you know, IT doesn't say they can have. We are looking to synchronize interpretation of IT and security systems, and that's how we catch security events in the first place. And the last thing is the potential. See, it's coming. It's not here yet. To, the potential to direct security where, it's, where and when it's most needed, you know, for users and data. Uh, Simplest example I can think of is applied behavior analytics and say, hey, I see new devices. These are devices on your network that, by the way, agents aren't reporting, but here they are. You know, we don't want to know about them and make sure they're not putting our business at risk. Well, maybe directing security might say, let's go scan it now. Um, check it for vulnerabilities. Let's check it for our asset control systems. Make sure we understand what it is. Uh, you know, do we need to upgrade or update the software? It's a different type of mentality as, as a, a strategy of analytics. You know, the vulnerability exploit patch model is, it just doesn't suffice. I mean, it's, that's where we're in today. We scramble around just trying to fix and plug holes, but you don't even see what happens. How can you, how can you fix it? The idea is to use analytics and start shifting your security strategy to one that's based on analytics first. You know, that's pretty much the chance to get ahead of the game, and then you direct security to be able to do the vulnerability uh, exploit patching things for you. The things that make it special, that makes me very bullish on applied behavior analytics, why it's a market category that's here to stay. You know, we all know about machine learning. The big thing about machine learning is it learns your business. It, you know, and, and David, I'm sure, is going to be showing you this. Learns users, data, you know, how they, how they behave, how they interact. Uh, it really is what's going on between the gaps. You know, you still need all those security silos but the main action is what's happening in between. It's, it's synchronizing intelligence. We direct, detect business logic abuses with people and data. Uh, a key thing, it tends not to drive purchase decisions, but as you evaluate behavior analytics, you know, I've seen it reduce incident response cycle times dramatically. I mean, 20X is not unheard of uh, and not uncommon. 
And it does that because all the information you need for an investigation is already accumulated. You got it. It, it already, because it's, it's looking at behavior, it has a user history, it has IP addresses, it has applications touched, it can see changes in configurations, it's there at your fingertips. It's actually more enriched contextual information that you need to protect the business rather than putting together you know, lots and lots of log data. And it provides a platform to act. Again, this is more of a future one, but... Um, you know, we all want blocking at some point. We would do it with endpoints. If you see an attack, do something about it. You know, so maybe it's on-demand scanning. Maybe it's asking for re-authentication. Maybe it's coordinating across silos. In the case of phishing or ransomware, where you detect something that's happening and you need to be able to send signals or to be able to, to orchestrate uh, your, your security system to be able to do that. And it, it all starts with being able to detect based on behavior before you even get going. So my recommendations, and this is as fast as I can talk, so thank you for putting up with me. Uh, log management and SecOps, in my opinion, are two different things. And, the, and we're going to see that become really clear through 2017. Log management for auditors and compliance, and very important. You know, I don't diminish that or, or denigrate that at all. But ABA is for SecOps and, <laughs> and management, which I think is spelled kind of funny, and I apologize, that, that was all on me. Um, but we are going to see strategy of shifting for, towards ABA. You know, and we're going to do it because of specific success metrics you'll see in your organization, whether it's account impersonation, data leakage, noise reduction of alerts, uh, compliance orchestrations. Uh, you know, how do you really know that devices are talking to your, your log management systems and, and aren't talking? Um, how do you handle non-compliant devices? And it's getting easier all the time. So my last recommendation really is try it. It's, in 30 days, you'll start seeing things that you, you never knew existed in, in your network. Um, you know, just guarantee it. And here's what's happening. And this is actually, you know, if I do this better, it would be two arrows. It's kind of like separates a little bit, but because I'm not anti-SIM, but I am very much pro-ABA, pro-SecOps, is the machine learning and the ability to protect the business logic is something that is going to elevate applied behavior analytics uh, log management and being able to process events and manage compliance and report to business, still hugely, hugely important. But from a SecOps standpoint, you know, the action is going to be with ABA. So with that, I thank you so much for putting up with me. Uh, let me get you to the geek, and uh, he can tell you what, what Securonics has got going on. David. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. So I'm going to give you the simple version. I, I believe that that behavioral analytics is all about learning normal and finding weird. I'm, I'm a curmudgeon. I, I've been dealing with this stuff for forever and a day, and I can tell you I like SIM. I'm very pro-SIM. Um, Michael Leland, the former CTO of Nitro, introduced me at one of the focus conferences, at one of the McAfee conferences in Vegas, as a SIM savant. And my response was, well, def de definitely SIM. De definitely SIM. I, I, there are a lot of great things we can do with it but there are a lot of things that get missed. And the problem that we really have to deal with is stupid user tricks. The reality is it's not just about protecting the machines. It's about protecting our assets from our users, whether they're intentionally stealing something or whether they did something stupid on the Internet, which unfortunately my users, maybe yours are better than mine, but mine do all the time, they get their accounts compromised, like using the same username and password on Yahoo that they use on my corporate network. So once Yahoo's breached, now I've got to reset all my passwords. Uh, that's the stuff I deal with all the time. And I would tell you that what behavioral analytics can do that we haven't been able to do with our, our traditional tools, and pick any rule-based tool, the rule-based tools say if X happens more than Y times in Z time interval. And it, it does two things really well. It looks for everything counts in large amounts. You do a lot of firewall drops or a lot of IDS events, that IP address goes on a list. You do any two things wrong, you go to the top of the list. Great. That'll find you malware. That does not, however, unfortunately find me the account that's compromised, that's using legit credentials to steal my data, whether it's because they want to intentionally or whether it's because they're an outsider who just harvested accounts and found their way in. I still have to protect myself from the users. And the bad news is the 2015 versus the 2014 data breach reports from Verizon said it got worse, not better. It actually increased almost 50% when they did spam 
analysis who actually clicked on the spam on the URL that was in it and who downloaded the executable. It went up almost 50%, not down. So either the spear fisheries are getting better or our users, despite education, are getting worse. And the problem is huge. I get to do breach response. And fortunately, I can tell you I know the teams for each and every one of these accounts. And this slide is now getting a little bit old because Neiman Marcus in 2014, the 222 million was the first set. I believe that's well up over half a billion dollars now. Uh, TJX ended up around 450 million, but these things are huge company ending events. And these are external numbers. The stuff in blue is actually hard links to external sites. So this stuff costs us lots and lots and lots of money. Even if it's the few and far between, if we're lucky, that's the stuff that unfortunately has access to the critical intellectual property or the financial transaction capabilities to steal real money or cost us real loss. Now, I did SIMS for a decade, and I had to come back and figure out, well, why are we missing it? What's wrong? One of the problems is that we're not collecting all of the logs that we need, and we keep trying to feed the SIMS more, but that costs money, and the SIM vendors ask us for bigger licenses. We're throwing more hardware at it. It gets expensive. I, I literally saw one of the companies I was working with write a $26 million check to, app, or to our folks at Splunk to say, hey, I need my renewal for next year. And they about choked on that renewal license, um, weren't real happy about writing that check, and they collecting four terabytes plus a day. It's nasty. The challenge, however, though, is not just that we're collecting a lot. In fact, I would tell you that one of the biggest customers I've worked with, one of our partners uh, down in Austin working with the HP data center where they're actually hosting multiple sites, they collect over 8 billion events a day. Out at Microsoft, we're dealing with upwards of a billion seven a day. It's very common these days to see a few hundred million events a day coming into an enterprise. We have to figure out how to get to the right needles in that massive haystack pretty quickly. Rule-based tools can get us to about four nines, a 99.99% event reduction. One in, between 10 and 100 out. What we've got to do is get that, or sorry, one million in between 10 and 100 out. We've got to actually get that down another order to a magnitude, which is where behavioral analytics comes into play and where collecting the right logs comes into play. In fact, as you look at what we want to do with behavioral analytics and apply it to security, I would suggest to you the first thing you want to look at is, what am I protecting? Now, I've published a few papers out on SANS over the years on SIMS and best practices and compliance. And I'll tell you the model that I follow is called a CAVE model, Controls, Assets, Visibility, and Enrichment. The first thing I look at for an organization, what's the asset I want to protect? Because that's the log that I want to get visibility into. Where is the critical stuff that I need? Now, that's why the stuff in red, the actual application data and the identity data is marked in red because it's the stuff that we're very seldom fed on the security team, and it's stuff I absolutely have to have for context. Where behavioral analytics starts to come into play, and particularly moving into the user aspect of it, is enriching the data set with a firewall event that says this IP address, talk to that IP address, telling me who the user is. Worse yet, when I start seeing SharePoint or file logs of some kind, user one accessed file two, and I'm asked to decide if it's good or bad. Well, when I know the context, and I say user one is in accounting, and file two is an engineering document that contains intellectual property on how do I build this multi-million dollar machine, I go, wait, accountants shouldn't be accessing engineering plans. That doesn't look right. That's what we're going to call peer groups when we look into behavioral analytics. And we start actually taking these log stores, these applications that I, I was loath to bring in to a SIM tool because I had no context. User 1, access file 2, good or bad? I don't know. And this minute they give it to me, they're, I'm supposed to know. When I can add context around peer groups and say user 1 is an accountant, accountants have never touched file 2, oh crap, why is he looking at file 2? That's what we start to talk about with behavioral analytics. That's where we start to turn a corner and let machine learning figure out what normal looks like and start to find the weird. So normal starts to be, is this behavior that other people do or is it something different? 
Literally, learn normal, find weird. When I'm in Texas, I work with sales guys, I've got to keep it simple language. Learn normal, find weird. The weird that we're looking for, the main issues we're starting to deal with is data loss prevention. Beyond just a DLP tool, DLP tools struggle with a bunch of things because we're looking for regex pattern matches and specific rules. And a lot of the content we've got to protect doesn't have a credit card number or social security that's going to match a regex pattern. And the minute they encrypt it, all of a sudden our DLP tools can't see it. But I can say that a user accessing who normally looks at 50 files a day, like Jun Z, a GE who was convicted in court, who now starts accessing 2.5 million documents, and you go, wait a minute, these not only were a spike of 50 to 2.5 million, huge change, and the documents he was looking at had nothing to do with his job. They were about how to build a, an MRI scanner, a multi-million dollar medical device, or a CAT scanner. John was on an H-1B visa here from China. He's been convicted in court in Wisconsin, which is why I can talk about him. That's a change of behavior. Learn normal, find weird. This is how we find the stupid user tricks, which, and frankly, that's what we're dealing with a lot of times. How do my users get my, this, my network compromised? We start looking for fraud. We start looking for compromised accounts and data prevention. I start with use cases. I buy a tool if you've already got the problem solved. Again, from Texas, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But there are some things that I really have struggled to do with the tools I've had in place for the security teams. And it's really that unusual activity that's almost the impossible to spot. Why did John log in from an IP address he's never logged in from before? Why did he access a million more documents on a single given hour than he's ever looked at before? from files that not only he, but nobody like him has ever looked at before. Those are the unusual, or normal, fine, weird. Machine learning isn't some crazy complex algorithm. It's build the metadata. What IP addresses do you log in from over a 30-day period? Great, I can learn your normal. What transactions do you execute in application one? What transactions do you execute in application two? And how often do you do them? Once I learn normal, now I get to tell you about something that's changed. Your behavior has changed. This user is doing something different. You start adding those together to build risk scores, to say this is the highest risk stuff. As you look through these things, you start to see not just one indicator, but two or three indicators that tell me who the problem is. Now, it does make for a little bit bigger single pane of glass, because we pull in not just the SIM data. In fact, the SIM now becomes a nice log aggregation source if it's already in play. We feed that data up into the behavioral analytics tool. Along with it, we feed identity data. And the first thing the behavioral analytics tool does is overlay all the identity data from the IM tool or from Active Directory or from HR flat files. Because if you're getting a paycheck, somebody in your organization knows your name, knows your manager, knows your department. Great. I can use that to learn who to compare you against and figure out normal. And then we move a step beyond just looking for malware and start pulling in the applications that are critical to the business. That cave model, what's the critical asset? That's the one I want visibility to. I want the logs from that application. Because now I'm no longer looking for, is this symptom of the machines infested with some malware? But I'm now looking for the, tel the bank teller in Colleen, Texas, that just had $100,000 in cash transactions in the last hour, when the entire branch in Colleen, Texas has never done $100,000 in a 24-hour period. Oh, crap. Let's shut down our access before we hemorrhage more money. Let's start preventing the, the actual cash losses to the organization. Or the Gen Z at GE who's stealing 2.5 million documents on how do you build a multi-million dollar device and he's ready to head home to China. Well, that's the intellectual property that costs companies serious money. Now, you also have to step that up a little bit further because half the apps, as Eric was saying, are sitting in the cloud now. And we have to actually be able to pull the application logs and look for normal in those logs and find the weird. If we do that right, we should be able to not only find, learn normal and find weird, we should be able to reduce the total amount of events that were being flagged as events of interest from our SIM, that were hitting those repeat attacks, those everything counts in large amounts rules. We should be able to aggregate them together at the user or the machine level and reduce it by another order of two of magnitude in terms of events of interest we have to look at a day to prevent threats. Machine learning, normal, profiling, how often do you do it? What do you do? 
by hour, by day, by week, by month. And it literally is building a metabase of what do you do. There are all kinds of interesting things we can do with it, and I don't want to bore you with them, but I do want to offer that to you if you ever want after the fact. We'll be glad to go through this with you and show you in depth how this stuff works. Now, one of the key things to user side of behavioral analytics, and behavioral analytics can be applied at the user or the machine. So at the user side, which is what we're looking for for fraud and data exfiltration, we start looking for who are you in each different log. Because unfortunately, most of our logs don't normalize the user field into a common identity. So you see in Active Directory, he logs in as John Smith. In his application, like Epic, for his medical data, he logs in as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And as he goes into his cloud application, he's John S1. Well, first thing I have to do is dynamically learn and pivot on the user to say these are all John Smiths. As I pull in identity data, I learn, and that's where we start, I learn who he is. Then as I look at log fields, if I see a user field in the log, I say, great, does that contain his first name and last name? Or does it contain first initial, last initial employee ID? And I learn how to pivot on his username so that no matter where the user logs in on the enterprise, no matter which application or which variation on his name, it's still all correlated back to that user. That's what gets us that first or second order of magnitude of reduction. Now, we can do that at the machine level as well, and some events will be done at both levels. At the machine level, you're starting to look for things like a point-of-sale machine at one of our customers, like Target, that's running an executable that none of the other point-of-sale machines are running, that's, ex that's communicating with an IP address in a foreign country that none of the other point-of-sale machines are communicating with. And you play Sesame Street. I literally want security to be Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. Take it off the network. And it's not because it's doing one weird thing. It's because there's an accumulation of behavior, multiple different events and multiple different log sources that tells me this device or this user is doing something different. I don't know for certain that it's bad until I investigate. But I can say that it's different and it's probably not good if none of the other users like him and none of the other machines like that machine are doing it. Why are you the only ATM machine in all of Israel to spit out over $100,000 in cash in the last 24 hours? Hmm. Well, that could be normal. Maybe you're the busiest ATM machine in all of Israel. Cool. I can suppress it because it's normal behavior. But if not, I go, I got a problem. Now, the other thing that happens is we're not given clean data sets. Maybe you are, but none of the networks I've walked into were clean when I started. They give me this network, and they go, black. here it is. Here's your 100,000 machines. Here's your 2 billion events a day. Figure out what weird and normal is in that. And they give me very little information to go on. So now we actually start looking for peer analysis to say, you know what, it's not just that it's different than his behavior, but it's different than other people's like him. So if I've got five database administrators in the organization, and one of them's a little bit sharper than the others, and that particular guy figured out that the financial application running on top of his Oracle database has the ability to transfer money to and from accounts. Every Friday for the last five years, he's transferred $9,999 is to, into his offshore account in the Grand Caymans. Next week, he's having his retirement party. He's had a good year. Uh, it would look normal because every Friday I would see the same amount transferred to the same account by this user. So at a user level, it looks normal. But when I can say, wait a minute, what do database administrators do? And I apply a machine learning algorithm so the system automatically learns this. So they create table, drop table, alter table. Here are the unique commands that they execute in Oracle. Well, why is John the only guy to ever do a wire transfer? That ain't right. And he's the only person in the entire company to transfer money to that destination account in the Grand Caymans. Oh, there's no way that's right. And now I have clear symptoms of fraud. And I can actually find and prevent the data loss, try to go recoup the money, prevent it from happening again. To get there, the basics, product in specific, and I'm trying to stay away from a product pitch and tell you how do you get to success with any behavioral analytics. We need to auto-discover normal machine learning to find normal. What do they do on any given day? What unique transactions? We have to correlate the identity. I have to accept that the user may not even appear in the log source, 
like NetFlow data, and I may have to look up and overlay who was logged on to that IP at the time the event occurred. I have to look for and continuously update that normal. What's the baseline? I have to be able to do peer groups to find and know who to compare you against so that when we're given this pile of massive logs and no identity information and no asset information of who owns it, to know who to compare you against. So I can say this is bad behavior. And these are the basics. We want to be able to threat score and risk rank each of those indicators of compromise, those IOCs, up together, aggregating at a user and machine level to be able to say this is the machine that has three, four, five different symptoms in two or three different log sources that tell me that's the user that's compromised. So these are the basics on how we get there. Now, success. Start with a cave model. What are we protecting? What's the asset we're going to protect? How do I get the logs to get visibility into what I need? What's the enrichment data that I need to be able to take the logs and find the needles? For every log source, there's a complement. For firewall data, you pull in crowdsource data. Here's the known evil IP addresses. Great. If I have a machine on the inside talking to an evil IP address known on the outside, I got a problem. If I'm talking IDS data, this attack is occurring. It's against a Microsoft operating system running Internet Explorer. Great. Does the vulnerability scan data, my complementary data, tell me that asset is vulnerable or not? For every log source, there's a complement to the enrichment side. And last, I always map it back into controls. What can I go back and affect to block this attack if I see it? Do I have a firewall? Do I have an IDS or an IPS? Is it inline and blocking capable? Or is it just there as a log source? So we go back and map out how do we block. Keys determine what you need to protect. What's the critical app for the company? It's not about protecting the machines anymore. It's about protecting the business, the critical assets to the business, whether that's intellectual property or financial transactions. Let's start looking at who's interacting with the data that our company cares about, not just look at the machine problems. Identify your use cases. Always start with a use case. I don't want a new tool. I want to solve a new problem. Until I know what the problem is, I shouldn't be shopping for tools. So I start with use cases, and that's why one of the slides kind of has those top 10 use cases. We have a threat library with about a 1,000 of them now, learned from customer engagement after customer engagement for about the last seven years. So we can help you with that if you're not sure which use cases. But it tends to fall under two basic areas, insider threats and, and data exfiltration. Now, that insider threat can be a compromised account. It could be high-privileged account monitoring. There are multiple variations on it. But it does tend to start with looking for data exfiltration and insider threats, whether it was externally compromised or internally intentional. Make sure you got the right log source to support it. Nothing in, nothing out. If we don't have log data, we can't do analysis. And for every log source, bring in the complement. So those are some basics. And if you guys have the time, our next piece is to answer some questions. So I prefer to let you guys ask a few so it's a little interactive. And then if you want, I'll show you exactly how this tool works. Works. I'll show you a live demo. So Eric, any questions you think we ought to address? Uh, audience, please type in questions or let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool, David. Is uh, yeah, I learn something every time I, I hear you. Uh, I hear you talk, which is pretty cool, especially the multiple personas. I mean, that's that's one thing we we think of one, you know, one identity, one person. But that's just not the way the world is. I mean, we all have you know, multiple IDs, multiple names for um, you know personal and professional lives, and being able to combine those makes makes perfect sense. And then, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. I, a single sign-on is that lovely unicorn we've all been chasing for years. I, I find <laughs> most of the time you're lucky if you've got 50 or 60 percent participation in single sign-on. And those other 40 percent of the critical apps, yeah, you've got two or three different IDs. Isn't that something? I, I, I uh, worked for a, a, uh, an authentication vendor, and it was like this thirst for apps. I mean, single sign-on was, we, you know, we can never achieve it because we were always figuring out more apps that just weren't signed in. Uh, just amazing. I, but actually, I'm kind of curious. One, you know, got one question that came in 
and you know, and I think it's referring to you know, all the different use cases you see when you when you're talking to to enterprises. Have you seen any trends to the top security challenges that the most most enterprises are worried about for 2017 going forward? Well, I'll start with CNN. CNN said for 2016, and they expected it to continue into 2017, the top risk to businesses, to enterprises right now, is spam. It's the number one infection vector. They're targeting our users. They're sending better and better phishing campaigns, spear phishing, going after our executive team who has access to the critical stuff, and getting them to click on the compromised URL or that zero-day exploit. So that's where it starts. And spam is just its that tip of the iceberg. It's the one that we know about. And it really does boil down to the outside world is targeting us, and their messages are unfortunately getting better and better at getting our users to click on things, and our user accounts get compromised. I believe that's number one. That's where it starts, but then what's stolen or what's important varies a little bit by organization, but it's almost always either intellectual property or financial. But yeah. the, the big one, I guess there's one variation on that I should mention. For the executive team, they're worried about personally identifiable information or <coughs> patient health care information, PII, PHI data, getting stolen, the stuff that gets them in the papers and loses them their jobs. Yeah, no one wa no one wants to be at the top of the search engine hit list when it comes to breaches, and that's <laughs> that's certainly the case. And and I, you know I call it business logic, but I see the same thing in, in terms of spam. Is you know why would why would anyone write code and try to figure out how to wiggle it into a network? You, know, you just don't need to. <laughs> you know, just launch a you know it's just arithmetic, right? If you if you if you have two hundred thousand users or a hundred thousand in your in your organization and you have a two percent hit rate. Well, just fire off a bunch of emails with links and see who clicks. Goodness knows I get enough of them. I think uh, the IRS at least 15 times this year told me that I was going to be arrested. So <laughs> I don't know what scams you got, but that was the one that got me the most. We, we learned well, back in World War II that the users that are easy to compromise, when we broke the Enigma machine, it wasn't because we we created a new Enigma sh machine or figured out how to unlock the code. We kidnap some of the guys that built it and ask them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you go after the end users. Well, well I, I'm glad the IRS is uh, is benevolent, and, and if they lock you up, they at least lock you up in, in a place where you have Wi-Fi and a telephone so you can help us out with the webinar, <laughs> which is pretty cool. But, but I, I, have, I have another question that, that came in, David, is um, I think so there's some, some clarity of, of you know, how, how does Securonics help find compromised accounts and data misuse. I mean, that, those are the two big things, right? People and data. So, I mean, how do you go about doing? I mean, how do you do that? It, it really is Sesame Street. Which of these users are doing something they've never done before? And you start aggregating multiples of those together that tell us, yeah, this is the really nasty one. So I'm going to take a little bit of indulgence and share my screen real quickly. So pardon me while I switch over, just so I can show you what it truly yep. looks like because I think that becomes a lot more interesting than me talking to it. So when I start oh, looking for what a yeah. compromised account looks like, and I go back and I d drill into somebody like Kevin Milton, who's showing signs of data exfiltration. Pardon me here. Clicked. Playing mouse games here. Browser helper after browser helper. So if I look at Kevin Milton and I want to look for what's wrong, what I start seeing is it's not just one or two things. Kevin Milton starts with signs that he's leaving the company. Why is he using from our proxy data? We see he keeps going out to job site after job site. Okay, zero risk associated with that event. Free country is allowed to leave, but something good to note for the analyst. An early indicator that, yeah, if they're data exfiltration events, this is a guy I want to look at carefully. Then he starts emailing, he starts looking for resumes. Where it really gets interesting, the learn normal and find weird, is when we get pretty horrible logs like our typical SharePoint logs. SharePoint logs say user A downloaded a file, in this case, Kevin Milton. Now, that alone means nothing. But the fact that user A, based on his peer group, I, I know nothing about the data, but I can say I don't any, know any, have to know anything about who Kevin is. But 
the fact that from identity I learned his title is Associate in Data Services, and he's one of 11 people that had that title, but he's the only one of those 11 that's ever looked at these files. Wait, why is my data services guy in IT department going out and grabbing company sales spreadsheets? Why is he grabbing all these files that nobody like him is doing? There are 27 people in his data services department, and only two have ever looked at these files. This starts to tell me this is unusual activity. That unusual activity followed that I've been looking for a new job, which then leads to DLP events. And it's not just that he tried to write to a USB drive one time. It's that instead of looking at one USB drive, he looked at a few hundred and block after block after block as this user tries to go out and write to USB drives, gets blocked, Semantics does its job, says, okay, that's fine. I I'm not worried that you tried to get out because you didn't go anywhere yet, but you're another indicator there's an intentional theft. And then, like every smart user or every attacker, he says, okay, you know, you got DLP on one vector, but hey, I'll just email it to myself using my account on my external account name. So Ironport then tells me, not only did he email himself, but he emailed himself 59 times today when he normally only does it about 11. Why did he email from his corporate account to his Comcast account? Those same files that, that, Mac, that our semantic DLP was blocking, he just found a different vector out. And this is what we mean by joining together those events into a risk score so instead of looking at 96 individual events, each event being risk scored from 0 to 1.0, a probability, I've got almost 96 events rolled together, two orders of magnitude of reduction. All of these events across different log sources aggregated together into a risk to say, Kevin Milton is trying to steal your data. And unfortunately, it looks like he's already got it because he was able to email it himself. And instead of just posting to a few outside sites today, he posted almost 83,000 times today to Dropbox and Google Drive and every place he could think to post all that sensitive financial data. Kevin's behavior changed, and it got really ugly really fast. That's what we're trying to do. And actually, I mean, if you don't mind, this is kind of go off script a little bit here on you, David, but you know, you're learning what Kevin is, is doing. But what if Kevin's already you know, a bad actor? I mean, can you catch the compromised account just by, by peer groups so that you, I, basically you're not learning illicit activity as something that's normal? Absolutely. Did I face that right, so, a good way? I'm just, yeah. Absolutely. i um, trying to think of the best way to show that to you. Um, so an account that we know nothing about. We've got no previous history. I'm going to switch and look at one of those service accounts. This is the stuff that we usually whitelist and miss. And this is where the really nasty stuff gets stolen. And every data breach based breach report I've dealt with, this is what I start to get into. Uh, this is a little bit different variation because this is a, a still a user-based risk. I'll come back to the peer-based anomaly. But this is that traditional account that causes me issues. Why did it just log in interactively if it's a service account? Keyboard-based login from an IP address that's never done before and executes commands that this account's never done before. And it's not a command that I ever want to see a service account logging in from an external IP do. Select star from my critical table and delete from audit log where like SVCDB backup so I'm no longer in the logs. That's that service account misuse. Sorry, that wasn't quite the variation you were asking, but it's another interesting one. I'm going to go back to Kevin because just within Kevin, we had the command that was different than we ever expected. Uh, anomalous activity compared to peers. So the direct answer, using SharePoint data and, and peer analysis, SharePoint, my worst nightmare of logs for a security analyst, user A access file B, but it's now used that identity data to say, I don't have to know what files Kevin's supposed to look at. I just have to know what files other people like him do. The fact that he's going out and grabbing a bunch of these, that other people like him with the same title and in the same department don't make this a very rare event and tell me this is that unusual activity, that theft of data from somebody who just started doing it. He's the only one in his title to do it. Does that kind of answer the question? 
Yeah, it does for me. I actually, you, you do pretty. You, you have a future in this industry. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's because of the peer group. Is you know, if if someone's a, and this is actually why you can, if you try applied behavior analytics, you know, in my opinion, opinion, within 30 days, you'll 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 see a ton of stuff. Is because you're not learning bad behavior and, and treating it as normal as good. It's because even then it sticks out compared to, you know peers by job title, by function, by traffic patterns. I mean, it, it it becomes readily apparent that there's already an issue that you're detecting, which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah We're really so, looking uh, for rare events or for volume that's different. They just did something they've never done. They just did something somebody like them has never done. That can yeah. be running an executable. That can be opening a file. It doesn't matter what it is. They're just, it's just an event from a log source that's different than other people like them. Yeah, yeah, and, and I was gonna, I'm going to ask you about insiders in a second, but one of the, I just want to interject also is one of, one of the things I have found is is this almost can work as a deterrent. I, I've seen that in places too where you know people worried about outsourcers abusing privileges and you know going into HR systems on weekends and stuff like that, snooping. Uh, but just knowing that there's a system that's looking at behavior, you know, even without you know wrapping anyone's knuckles, is, is pretty effective. Uh, is you know we talked about data leakage and account, compromised accounts. You know, some of your examples are actually you know, insider abuse. Is that a big thing for you? Uh, it is, and it's not usually an intentional insider. Those are mm. the really big risky ones. I would say that about ninety percent are an external somebody on the outside compromised the internal account and are misusing yeah. it. It's just once they're inside, they're not using malware anymore. They're using legit credentials. And they're stealing the data using legit credentials. But I want to address the other side. You said can act as a deterrent. And it absolutely can because there's an easier version of this that we can do. So we actually do access intelligence and analytics as well. As you start looking for entitlements, one of the things we do with the entitlement data is actually send reports back to whoever had generated the risk. So I can come back and I can say that we did this with one financial services customer where it went through and it said, well, wait a minute, you are the only person that happens to be part of that Active Directory user group and has the ability to, in this case, it's Retail Massachusetts. You've got rights to do different things in Active Directory that none of the other 10 people that share your title, none of the other 10 people that share your department have. Do you still need it? Mm -hmm. And we can do this in two forms. One of the ones at one of our clients, we actually sent this as a self-certification report, something we have to do for compliance anyway, to our end users say, here are all your entitlements that look really weird. Do you still need this? And we had almost a 95% revocation rate where the user said, no, I don't use that anymore. Because as we stay in companies longer and longer, usually what happens is we accumulate rights. People are pretty mm -hmm. good about provisioning new, us new users, mm -hmm. but when they change roles, nobody goes back through and audits and takes away the entitlements they no longer need, which breaks a basic accounting policy that says principle of least privilege. This starts to get into that proactive, how do we take away rights before they're misused? And we can do this as a self-deterrent and even as a self-certification and customers just say, these are rights that it doesn't look like you should have anymore based on your department and your title. And half of them will come back or more and say, nope, don't need it. Take it away. Very cool. And it's just going to automate that. And the more those rights are taken away, then the fewer holes you have in your organization. It just makes perfect sense. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in our goal as security analyst is to continuously reduce the exposed surface area. We'll never get to perfect, but we can improve every month. Yeah. Yeah, and and we do want to you know again job security is right is is malware is data and it is protecting our people which makes sense. Hey, we've got about two minutes left before we have to uh, turn it back to Kimberly to to wrap things up. I did have one question that came in. I was going to hold it, but I, get, I think I'll throw it out there to you anyway. This is uh, and and the question is I heard that we can call Securonics as next gen DLP. Could you refer to that? I mean you know, I've never heard that, but maybe you have. So I I, I guess I will let. You know, is that something you can answer, David? I'm not sure I would call it next-gen DLP. But no, I would say there I are lots of DLP use cases. 
So it's not a DLP tool in and of itself. DLP tends to look for regex pattern matches. There's endpoint. There are different vectors. But where it starts to become a, a DLP solution, even without DLP tools in some cases, is as we start building use cases on things like firewall data. I know that a, a given user does 10 megabytes a day through the firewall. Why all of a sudden did he do three, three terabytes today through the firewall? Oh, crap. I've got data exfiltration events. And if I combine that with the critical application log that says, well, just before that, 10 ter that three terabytes left the network, he just opened a whole lot more files on SharePoint than he's ever touched before. And they were all things that nobody else like him has ever touched before. I got data exfiltration. Now, I would tell you that the good news is this stuff works even if the data is encrypted because the firewall knows how many bytes were transferred. Yep. And it works even without a DLP tool. So in that case, it starts to cross over into that DLP tool world, and you start to do a lot of DLP-style use cases, even when we don't have DLP logs. I think it gives a more complete picture than a DLP alone does. Yeah, I, I agree. I think DLP is, is pattern matching for you know, PII information, stuff like that. But in terms of big data loss and some of the other traits that we see, it's uh, this is, uh, I think, a far stronger tool. Hey, let me respect people's time. Um, how about this? What if I give you 30 seconds and then um, and then we'll we'll wrap up? How's that? Absolutely. There we go. So any, any last any last words on your front? I I appreciate people's time. I think behavior analytics is the most exciting thing going on in security, and it's going to continue to be the most exciting thing going on through 2017. Um, I I've Thank you for attending. I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, any last words from you, David? I would just offer a private demo to anybody who wants to see it. We'd love to do use case workshops with you, talk to exactly what the assets we want to protect are and what the use cases that it fit your environment are. We'd be glad to help with that. Oh, good guy. Awesome. And, and with that, let me pass it to Kimberly because you know, your feedback is important to Securonics and to 451 Research. I mean, we... We value that, and we, we reflect that in, in future sessions. But let me turn it back to Kimberly, who can talk about feedback and, and also how to download a presentation and, and replace and get other, other information. Kimberly, it's all yours. <laughs> thank you, Eric. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We had a lot of great questions come in. Um, you should also be able to give us some feedback below, right below the slide screen right here. We'd love to hear your feedback. And also, if you have any more questions, feel free to email us here. I have David and Eric's emails here up on the screen. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. You could also include, if you have any questions, um, you can, if you don't want to email us, you can include it in your feedback to us, and we'll get back to you as well. So thank you, everyone, for your time. And we hope you have a wonderful day and a happy holiday season. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.